Thank you for joining us this evening for our third Authors of Mystery Talk. Um, this evening, we're going to talk with three um, mystery authors from the Sisters in Crime Heart of Texas chapter, and we'll be talking about writing humor in mysteries. Um, with me, I have K.P. Gresham, Kelly Cochran, and Nancy G. West. I'm going to read our three uh, bios, and then we'll get started on some questions. So I'm going to go just alphabetical by last name. So I'm going to start with Kelly Cochran, a geographic mutt. Kelly Cochran has lived on the East Coast, the West Coast, and in many places in between. During her childhood, she attended 13 different schools in 12 years, all before going off to college at the age of 17. To her surprise, she turned out somewhat normal and went on to have a 20-year career in information technology. Kelly's first book, Buying Time, was a finalist in the 2013 Next Generation Indie Book Awards and a quarter finalist in the 2014 Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award. A judge in the 22nd Writer's Digest Self-Published Awards said, In Buying Time, Kelly Cochran manages to keep her readers on the edge of their seats and in stitches as they laugh their way through this fun, fast-paced murder mystery novel. Cochran's tone is similar to Carol Higgins Clark, author of Snagged, Murder at a Pantyhose Convention, and the rest of the Reagan Riley mystery series. Kelly currently lives outside of Austin, Texas with her husband and three rescue dogs. Kelly's days are spent working a regular job and searching for the end of the internet as she wonders why she can't seem to find the time to finish writing her next book. You can find her at kellycochran.com. And we've got KP Gresham refers to herself as a professional character assassin, though not all of her books are mysteries. A dedicated Cub fan and former Chicagoan, her first book was Three Days at Wrigley Field, a critically acclaimed suspense novel that asked the question, which is more important in baseball, winning or tradition? P then turned to writing mysteries because that's her favorite genre to read, heavily influenced by Agatha Christie, What Mystery Writer Isn't, Sandra Brown and J.D. Robb, KP created Pastor Matt Hayden, a former cop turned preacher who can't stop falling over dead bodies. The Pastor Matt Hayden mystery series includes The Preacher's First Murder, Murder in the Second Pew, and the 2020 Silver Falchion Award finalist Murder on the Third Try. KP is elbow deep in writing the next in the series, Four Reasons to Die. KP is also working on a new series called The Hard Scrabble Homecoming Mystery Series. In the first book, Ellie Pruitt, divorced and destitute, is forced to return to her Illinois childhood home only to discover bodies, bodies everywhere. The Root of All Evil is a finalist in the 2020 Writers League of Texas Mystery Novel Competition. KP and her husband moved from Illinois to Texas 35 plus years ago and immediately fell in love with not shoveling snow. She okay. finds that her dual country citizenship, the Midwest and Texas, provides deep fodder for her award-winning novels, her varied career as a media librarian and technical director, middle school literature teacher and theater playwright and director, add humor and truth to her stories. A graduate of Houston's Rice University Novels Writing Colloquium, KP now resides in Austin, Texas. Um, you can find her at kpgresham.com. And our third author this evening is Nancy G. West. When Nancy was seven years old, she and her mother wrote poems to each other on special occasions. The poetry was awful, but Nancy learned if you wrote something, people stopped to read it. In high school, Library Journal's Pegasus published her poem, a feat she ranked beneath cheerleading. At 18, with journalists underpaid and English major graduates selling lingerie, she slogged through a general business at the University of Texas and earned a BBA. Fortunately, she took a creative writing course. <laughs> Married with two daughters, she read numerous books on writing and wrote articles, poetry, and the biography of the artist Jose Vivis Astara. Did I get that even close, Nancy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, wonderful for Shoal Creek Publishers and found Book Publishers of Texas, where she produced the association's trade journal and promoted members' books for seven years. Returning to her college to earn her MA, she studied English literature and began writing Nine Days to Evil, a novel of psychological suspense, Shakespeare, and nonstop action, which won the Blether Gold Award. Her poem, Time to Lie, featured by themes and variations, was broadcast on NPR. For three years, she wrote San Antonio's Woman's Bookshelf column and articles for other publications. She was honored by Friends of the San Antonio Library with the 2012 Arts and Letters Award, and her books and papers are in the Texas State University's Southwestern Writers, Southwest Writers Collection. She is the award-winning author of Psychological Suspense, Nine Days to Evil, the Aggie Mundine Mystery Series, and The Plunge, a suspenseful lead-in to the spin-off series, The Lake Mysteries, 
She recently completed a suspense coming of age novel, and you can find her at nancygwest.com. Welcome. Thank you for being here tonight, ladies. Thank you. All right. So um, I'm going to just go down for me and start with KP and do have you guys just tell us about um, your most recent book. Well, um, thank you, first of all, for hosting this and for inviting us. Oh, this is wonderful. Um, my latest book is Murder on the Third Try. It's the third uh, book in the Pastor Matt Hayden mystery series. Um, Matt was a police officer on the docks of Miami and ran into a lot of corruption on the um, in the higher ups in the police department. And um, he ended up having to enter the federal witness protection program because the bad guys didn't like him turning them in. And uh, in in the process, he became a pastor, a real pastor uh, at a Lutheran pastor and was sent to this small little town in Texas called Wilkes, Texas, which is a whole lot like LaGrange, Texas. And um, thought, okay, well, this is my new life. I'm, it's going to be peaceful. And it isn't. And uh, murders happen. And he has to put his cop's hat back on in order to get some of his parishioners off the hook for murder. And in this book, Murder on the Third Try, the bad guys catch up with him. Wonderful. All right. So I'm going to go with Kelly. If you'll go ahead and tell us about your last one. Trying to figure out which one was down and over from you. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is my, can you see? Like, hold it yes. up on it. This is uh, Borrowed Time. This is the second um, uh, book in the series. And my character is also in the Witness Protection Program. However, she's one of the rare ones that went into the Witness Protection Program and she's not a criminal or an officer or something like that. She's just a regular old person. Um, she, uh, in this book, she's really trying to work on getting her normal life. You know, she started in the first book, you know, trying to find something normal. She's getting a little bit better at it, you know, making friends. And she is a personal concierge. She started her own business and she does uh, do just about anything for anybody. And in this book, um, she has a uh, she has somebody contact her about finding a blue diamond that they want her to to get, and she uh, spends her time trying to track that down, um, but she doesn't really know who she's getting it for. And at, at the same time, she uh, is missing. Her landlord goes missing, and um, so she believes that she needs to give them the diamond in order to get her landlord back. And uh, so hilarious stuff ensues as she goes through and uh, is trying to you know, make this happen. Several dead bodies. Uh, and eventually uh, it all comes out great. And also uh, she has two men that are in her life and um, she is uh, struggling between both of them. And uh, so that storyline also goes along in here. And, uh, and I'm currently working on the, next one in the series. But they okay. kind of, the covers, you can see here, the covers are all the same. They're just different yeah. colors. And uh, then on the front, there's a clock that, so for the first book, it's at one o'clock and the second book is at two o'clock. And so it goes. Oh, that is a cool detail. Nancy, what was your uh, latest project? Um, the latest one is called The Plunge. And Aggie, Mundine, and Sam have gone through four books now and solved crimes in four places. And so now they've gone to the Guadalupe River to a river cottage. And the, the idea being that they won't have any crime there. It's all peaceful. <laughs> and uh, Sam confesses that he is trying to find a friend's boat that was stolen. But beyond that, it's going to be a peaceful time. And it is until the river rises and the 500-year flood that we all endured swamps Texas. And we were right next to that flood and involved in, in that. And so I thought, well, Aggie and Sam need to undergo that. And so I, I use that book as a bridge book. When, when that happens to them, it changes their outlook on life. And uh, she actually stays in Seguin to help the people 
who survived the flood. And of course, he works as a detective in San Antonio. So that's the lead into the new series called The Lake Mysteries. And I just thought it was time for a change. And I thought, what better thing to change you than enduring a flood? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's, that's the plunge. Wonderful. So you have each. This was a question that was actually asked in the earlier panel um, for setting and character. But based mm -hmm. on everybody's um, answers, I'm interested in what your answers are. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Nancy. What came first, the character or the setting? The character. Um, I was writing a very serious book called Nine Days to Evil about a young protagonist who is very serious. She's 23 or 24. And Aggie pops up in her class. And I think both Meredith and I needed some humor. And so Aggie popped up and got in my head and said, well, you are going to write a series about me. And I have delighted, I've been delighted with her ever since. She, um, she's strong-willed, she's uh, very curious, and she doesn't take direction well, which is great for solving crimes, but she manages to get in the middle of it most of the time. And so she came first, and then I had to decide where to put her, mm -hmm. and then came the settings. And I don't know if you want to talk about that now or later, but... Right there. Um, KP, for you, was it character or setting? Um, uh, character uh, and two milliseconds later, the setting. Yeah. Um, it was uh, just boom, boom. I knew I, uh, this. I'm talking about Pastor Matt Hayden. I, 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 his character came from the fact that my father was a, a minister. And yes. I, when I was growing up, I saw a lot of people put on their absolute best show for dad. Uh, you know, when we went out to dinner to their places, the Bible was open on the side where the best China was, you know, you, you want to make a good impression for the pastor, but that wasn't reality. Um, and so what I wanted to do was create a pastor who had his original steps of life in reality and the cop was was that i mean you, so anyway uh so that was that was where i wanted it to be but i knew i am not from texas and i knew that i needed to put matt in a place that he wasn't familiar with and i love texas and I just thought that's perfect. And there's this little tent. Well, I already said it, it's like range, um, uh, but it's Wilkes, Texas in the book. And um, it was perfect. It, it just boom, boom. Wonderful. Kelly, um, how about for you? Was sure, it character? Sure. Yeah. For the, for the uh, Aspen Moore series, it really, that was my first book. So they kind of just came right together. I was living in St. Louis, Missouri at the time. So it felt natural just to make it there since, you know, I was familiar with the area. And um, and then I knew I wanted to have a character who would be in an occupation that allowed her to, you know, go to see a bunch of different people. You know, and so she's a personal mm -hmm. concierge. I have a new, well, it's a series that's in draft. And on that one, I actually, the setting was first, and I actually drew a whole map of the streets and the town square and where the shops were and all that stuff before I brought the character in. Mm. Wow, that's awesome. Mm. So that actually um, kind of segues pretty good into um, the next question I'll do, which is what is the relationship, if any, between your own experience and the characters you, you create? Do you find your characters have the same sense of humor you do? And Kelly, um, if you'll, you kind of started to answer that. Um, how about the humor and aspect of that? Oh, oh, oh. So this is the one about between my experience and yeah. the characters. Yeah. I well, I like to say, well, I'm not in the witness protection program. <laughs> or am I? You don't know. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you know, I do draw from my own experiences and people I know and things like that. And I was saying it's um, interesting because, because I draw from my own experiences. I know some of these things are true. You know, and I had a situation where I did a manuscript swap with somebody, you know, where you review each other's manuscripts. And they were like, there is no way that this woman stayed in a relationship with this man 
for so many years when she wanted to get married. And then so she finally left. There's no way she would have stayed that long. And I'm thinking, oh, Lordy, <laughs> you know, I have two women friends that I know that, you know, stayed in the relationship long. So it was true. But he just had no concept of, you know, the belief that that could be true. And I don't know if it was because he was a man or if it was just because, you know, in his life, he didn't see that. So, so I do draw from the experiences, but it was interesting to find that people don't believe it sometimes, even though they're true. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that was like, and yeah. so, you know, I, I don't ever, I try to keep it so that nobody knows if I'm drawing from them. So they just kind of meld together. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you don't go too close to the line. Nancy, right. how about for you? How do you draw from your own experiences and do you find characters have the same sense of humor you do? I'm afraid so. <laughs> um, Aggie has a wry sense of humor and I think I do too. She um, she sees things in people and settings that, that I would see and not perhaps voice. And in fiction, she can voice it and react to it. And so I do put her in a lot of places where that I'm familiar with. One was set on the San Antonio River Walk during Fiesta. One is at a, as a at a dude ranch, and I've been to lots of those. And uh, one is at, at a university. We've all been to those. Mm -hmm. So I do put her where I've been, and uh, but her reactions to what she sees, she's a fish out of water like yours, KP, and so she's from Chicago. And so she sees the Texas foibles in a different way. And I really like to play on that. And that's part of the humor too. Yeah. Yeah. So KP, that, that but, seems to ring true for you as well. Exactly. Um, this, this character who's never been in Texas before, some of the things can be pretty comical if you've never seen it before. And um, uh, one of the, uh, in answer to the question is, um, I have a lot of my experiences go into all of my characters. Um, they'll show up. Um, one of the first guys I met when I came down to Texas, he was Texan. And he was big. And he, he's my one of my main characters in the story. I just love him. And so the way I reacted to him is the way Pastor Matt Hayden reacts to the sheriff he becomes he's the sheriff in the book and um and all of the characters come from people that i've known uh or experiences that i've had um yeah yeah um so we'll still start with you kp to keep you okay. talking a little longer do you intentionally write humor or does it kind of just pop up spontaneously from the character or the situation Okay, I think it's real. I, it, for the most part, my books are very serious. Uh, the Pastor Matt Hayden's uh, mystery series is serious. It's third person. Um, I have found that it's easier for me to do a funny book in first person because you can get so much inner dialogue going into your main character and, and things that you would never say to anyone you can still say inside and it's hysterical. You know, the, the readers can enjoy that. But in my serious books, I really want to have humor. I think it makes the book, I think I like the pacing on it. It really, you know, moves things along. Uh, it tells a lot about the characters themselves. Um, and um, I, in answer to your question, I create the characters and they tell me what's going to come out of their mouths. And um, so, like, uh, there's this one uh, woman that's in the book, and she is one of those, um, uh, a person that likes, okay, this is the way that we do it at the church. We always use these altar cloths. We always do this. It's, we've never done it like, you know, how many Lutherans does it change, uh, uh, take to change a light bulb? And the answer is change. OK, so, so she's like that. And um, I did not intend her at first to be a comedic character. But in order to make her lovable, because I don't like uh, caricature characters, in order to make her lovable, 
we got, I put some humor in there and it, and it works. Um, so did I answer your question? Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. Okay. Um, Kelly, for you is, does the humor, um, kind of pop up spontaneously? Or are you in, intentionally putting humor situations? In? Yeah, it's, it's pretty much spontaneously because a lot of the humor is from Aspen's thoughts or, or things that she says, but I also, um, uh, you know, have, have uh, some physical humor in it too. And there's sometimes when I'll go through, like I'll go through and I'll reread my, reread my books. And after I've read it a couple of times, if I laugh, I keep laughing every time I read it, then I know it's funny. You know, sometimes I've gone through and said, oh, that's really not that funny anymore. So I will sometimes remove things. Um, and then, uh, as I said, I also do kind of physical uh, stuff. And, and a lot of that revolved around, you know, the first book revolved around actions that Aspen made. So the, um, and one of the things I had gotten some comments from people that, oh, you know, she's kind of clueless, you know, your character is, although I had same re other reviews that they were like, which I thought was so funny. One person saying, gosh, she's just clueless, you know, an idiot. And then another person saying, I can so relate to her. She's just like me. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to improve on her as I move forward in the books. And, and because I'm, you know, not letting her make stupid decisions that were helping me get the humor in there, I have to work a little harder when I do some of the, the uh, you know, physical humor or things like that. So, but, uh, but a lot of the humor also just comes between her relationships with the two men. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. Or probably a lot in real life too. Nancy, yeah. for you, is it is it similar that um you're are you intentionally writing humor or as you said, she's wry like you? Does it just kind of spontaneously happen? It's pretty spontaneous. I have a couple of things that I set up to create the humor. And one is that she she is um totally off the wall the way she approaches things. And her the detective Sam is by the book. And so the conflict between them when they try to solve crime creates the humor. Mm. And also the places where she is, where she reacts to these people um, in an odd way. And I always try, at, either at the beginning or the end or both, to have a scene that is physical. Aggie, Aggie usually causes some problem that results in some fiasco. And that becomes physical, that particular scene. And I always like to have that, uh, at, at least one of those. That, that's perfect to our next question. Is that one of the ways you maintain the humor as you write her in several mysteries? Are there any other ways that you maintain uh, that humor? You know, as strange as it sounds, I think Aggie has infiltrated my brain to the point where she's just funny. Uh, what she says, what she thinks, and what she does, how she reacts to people is funny. It's a little peculiar and therefore funny. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I guess that's, I don't know what where that comes from. <laughs> uh -huh. that, that's great, though. It, you know, it, I love that you guys are kind of saying it's not really forced. So for KP, for you, how, is there oh, something you try to do to maintain um, that humor in several across several mysteries? It's not hard to do, but I'm not sure why. Um, <laughs> um, the it's it's it, it's just uh, plot points that some, they just need to be lightened up, or it's in the you know what? It's because it's in the character. Mm -hmm. It's not something that I say. Oh, okay, Joe Blow, you're going to be funny this time. It's because mm -hmm. the character that's developed through the books are going to have that. Um, tendency uh, to either be in the middle of something and it could be physical humor uh, to be the, the purveyor of the joke or to be it's it's within the characters um, so that's or uh, you know people always ask you so the people that have ticked you off are they the, are they the ones who kill and not for me the people that have ticked me off, I have usually done something funny to absolutely gig them <laughs> in, the, in the books. And that's my, uh, I mean, 
Um, no names, no times, but I had a boss one time who was a total jerk. And by golly, I got him good in one of the books. And I loved every second of it. It was so cathartic. And um, uh, so anyway, so yeah, how's that? <laughs> That's wonderful. And Kelly, for you, um, is there anything you do that to maintain that humor or as we've been saying? It's kind of sure. so I'm, you know, because I wrote, uh, because my character is a part of personal concierge, I have, you know, I have uh, some supporting characters who stay in the book. I've got like uh, Stephanie, who's the redhead from hell, you know, that she's there. She's a, uh, has her, all her own issues, but, sh but I also bring in new people each time because, um, because of where she goes to work for her clients. So I'm always able to add aspects of humor through those characters as well. So it makes it a little bit easier because I wouldn't want to go, um, you know, because she's got, Aspen's got a certain kind of humor. And if that was the only thing I was doing every book, I think it would get a little old. Um, uh, and also, like I said, because I'm trying to make her, you know, behave and not, you know, hold, hold information from people that could help her or, you know, make bad decisions all the time. And I'm trying to you know, have her grow a little bit, um, you know, so I have to pull back on some of the, those humorous things. I introduce it in through some of the supporting characters. Wonderful. Um, so uh, we've kind of touched on some of this already for this uh, next question, um, talking about uh, the first person um, humor coming from inner dialogue and third person humor kind of coming from um, physical and or situational. Um, are there any other ways uh, you can mention, Kelly, we'll start with you, um, that you use first person and third person humor differently? We kind of um, you know, I was thinking about that. Really, I think because I'm right from a first person perspective, you know, a lot of the humor is in her thoughts. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, things that, you know, she's thinking, gosh, I hope this doesn't happen. And then, of course, you know, it does happen. Um, uh, so a lot of that, her, her, her speaking, uh, you know, and then I guess really if, if you were saying from a third person perspective of the physical, just the, you know, the physical humor, um, that's all I can think. <laughs> Nancy, how about for you? Are there any other pieces of first person humor, third person humor that we haven't kind of already touched on when you're writing mysteries? No. I pretty much agree. Um, the first person is usually in her head. The third person is when she witnesses something or something else is happening, but it's still her reaction to it. Um, I, I agree with Kelly. Yeah. JP, is this one for you? Um, yeah. And, and what I like, too, about the first person is it's way easier for me to get my memories that I'm basing them on basing the humor on into the book. Mm -hmm. um, the Hard Scrabble Homecoming series that I'm working on. Um, it's about my um, life back in Illinois. And so I can, you know, really touch on that kind of stuff. And it's easier to get, it's easier for me to get the humor in it. Mm -hmm. um, and it has more of a place there. That's more of a, uh, a of a cozy for me. Uh, and, um, so that's uh, as opposed to the third person where it's character driven situational mm -hmm. is the way I call it. Yeah. Um, it does seem difficult that, um, including physical humor. So does no, of the humor, no, 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 no. That's wonderful. Do you, Nancy and Kelly, do you feel the same way? It's not too difficult to include uh, physical humor. Oh, yeah, for me, I mean, I can find all things for her. You know, I was trying to think of an example of hers, like one in one of the books, she goes undercover and she's got a wig and false teeth. And then when she goes to talk, the teeth go flying out of her mouth. And so, you know, you know some things like that. She's been, you know, had to hide in a bathroom when she was in somebody's hotel room and they came back to the room and she, I can get her in all kinds of physical stuff. <laughs> so I don't find it too difficult to do that. Wonderful. Nancy, is that the same for Aggie? Does she get into all kinds of things? You uh, Usually she, um, in Fit to be Dead, for example, 
the killer comes after her and, and everybody's in the showers getting ready to go work out. And so they all have to be evacuated. And I thought, what could be the worst thing that could happen to you when you were at, at the workout facility? And that would be to have to leave the shower <laughs> and run out of the building. And I thought, oh, uh -huh, yeah, we're going to use that. <laughs> so it usually comes from what could be the worst thing now that could happen. That's good. So um, I would like to ask the panel um, an audience question actually from the first go round. Um, what are some common mistakes for aspiring authors? So KP, let's start with you. They write the first chapter over and over and over again because they want it to be just perfect before they go on to the second chapter. And a year later, they're still working on the first chapter. So write it the best you can, um, but move on. Mm. Keep keep going into the writing process. That, that's why it's called a rough draft. And um, uh, that's what I would, and, and the other thing I would suggest is it's a craft. It is something, just as a ballet dancer, even the prima donnas go to class every day, take a class, get some of that just good old fashioned, know what you're doing down. Um, to this day, I, I've been doing this for a long time. I still take classes and I still learn stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the the minute that you stop learning stuff, you stagnate and the books are lousy. So anyway, those two things. That's great advice. Nancy, what advice do you have for aspiring authors? Well, the pansters are going to hate me, but, and I did this when I first started, you, you feel like you want to write something and you sit down and you write it and you feel so much better and it's cathartic and you realize that you have no idea where this is going to go. And so I think that you need to plan the, the, the book out, not everything, just what's going to happen. And is it logical? Does it make sense? And then you can go back and you can just pamster your way through it. But you have a roadmap. It's like a house. You have a frame. You can change the rooms. You can change the walls. But you have a frame at least. And then you can go back and do whatever you want in those rooms knock down walls, you know, put in windows, whatever. But you have to have some sort of plan. Otherwise, you get to the end or three quarters of the way through and you hit a wall or you think, I have no idea where this is going to go or this doesn't make sense. And that's the worst thing. This doesn't make sense. Yeah. So and I think in a mystery, it absolutely has to make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Kelly, for you, what was your what would your advice be for aspiring? Sure. I'm going to add a little something to Kathy's and then Nancy's and then I'll do mine. For Kathy's, I can say I agree with you. And it's like what I always like to say is there's always going to be a first draft. You can't get by that. There's always going to be a first draft. So just keep going instead of rewriting. And um, for Nancy, I'm a pantser and I agree with you. You really need to do an outline because you don't know how many times I write and then I'm halfway through and all of a sudden I'm like, well, where am I going? And then I have to stop and then I do an outline from the middle. So I am really working hard on trying to do an outline from the beginning. And I can do, I did a, a manual on uh, becoming an independent author and I had that whole thing outlined and I just knew where everything was going to go, but it was nonfiction. And so it was easier for me, the logical side, but the other, you know, the creative side was not. So I'm still working on that. Um, but I'd like to add that, you know, try to get support, try to find a critique group. You know, I um, wrote something, you know, wrote like a couple of pages of something, put it in a drawer, wrote it. I have a lot of things that are started and not finished. And then I, um, I joined Sisters in Crime and they have a 100% online chapter called the Guppies, which stands for the Great Unpublished. And I joined them and found a online critique group through them and we wrote every week and you know it made us have to write something and so with them I was able to finish my my entire book and uh, and it was great because you got feedback as you're going along the way and and you learned a lot from each other 
Um, and I'm still, that was like 10 years ago, and I, we still keep in touch with one another, not on a daily mm-hmm. basis, but, but I'm part of a local uh, critique group. And so that's definitely something I would do because it just kind of makes you continue moving forward. Mm-hmm. So, I'm yeah. That's wonderful, wonderful advice. Yeah. And so this panel will be airing in November, which um, is NaNoWriMo. So yes. we are, um, we're hopefully, maybe you'll have projects. We're going to be encouraging that here at Pflugerville Library. We'll have a uh, romance panel, romance writing panel, and another writing uh, workshop with a local author. Um, so we are all for that. That's wonderful. Okay. So one of the fun things I, uh, ideas I had for this little panel series was to do a two truths and a lie with our authors. So if you're watching this, hopefully you may have seen in the lead up to this panel, um, some graphics on the library, uh, social media channels, and we are going to, I'm going to share my screen again, and I'm going to read off the three statements from each of our authors. And then we'll have the other two authors, Take a guess as to which of our three statements is the lie. And so we'll start. There we go. Okay, we're going to start with KP. So KP wrote her first book at six years old. The first draft of the first book KP published was 1,200 pages single spaced. And KP has ghostwritten a book with JD Robb, the pen name of Nora Roberts. Um, so, Nancy, what's your guess as to which might be the untrue statement? I don't think, ooh, that's hard. <laughs> I don't think she wrote, wrote a first draft that was 1,200 pages. Okay. Um, Kelly, what do you think might be the untrue statement? I, I agree with Nancy. This one's hard. But I'm thinking, I would think that if she ghost wrote a book that I would know that. And I don't know that, so but but that doesn't mean anything because I don't know. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pick that one. The ghost ghost write a book. Yeah. Oh, I'll go to the next. You are correct. KP oh, is hey, 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 book with JD Rob. But <laughs> that means that. you were very young, KP, when you wrote that wrote that yeah. My mom and dad asked me what I wanted for uh Christmas. And um I said I wanted a typewriter. And they got me one of those old Underwood, um, really hard to press the keys with the two little dials for the tape on top. They got me that for my for my present. And I cut out little pieces of paper so that they were the size of a book. And wow. I wrote a 68 page uh, story, single spaced, uh, about something about a family who looked a whole lot like the Bob Cleave twins. <laughs> wonderful and the first okay. draft seriously i i've still got it it's 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 like this big oh, and it was three it was three on. days at wrigley field it was first called was stop years. sharing so show us how big again oh, i can't even imagine it yeah was, 1200. It was big. and um it was uh uh it first took it's for three days at wrigley field it took place over three years and then i got it down to a year and then I went to the Rice Novels Colloquium, writing colloquium, and I got it down to five days. <laughs> and then it went to three days. And I thought, I better stop now or it's going to be a short story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I did want to give a plug to uh, J.D. Robb. That, uh, first of all, she does not have people that ghost write for her. I wanted to make that really clear. Uh, but second of all, she is... Her her uh, series that takes place in um, uh, 2054. Yeah, it is a phenomenal mystery series, and I just encourage people to get to know that futuristic mystery. Mm-hmm. It's great. The Eve Eve Duncan or Eve Dallas. Eve, Eve Dallas, good girl, yeah. you do it. Mary <laughs> Rourke, what a hunk. But anyway, <laughs> okay. So next we have. I'm going to share my screen again. Next, we have Nancy. So Nancy is learning to play guitar. Nancy writes from 8 a.m. to noon, four days a week, no matter what. And Nancy hates getting her hands dirty, but loves grouting around tile to make tabletops. So, uh, KP, what do you think might be the untrue statement there? Ugh, man, okay. 
man, I wish I could write from eight to noon four days a week. <laughs> um, hates getting her hands dirty, but loves grouting. That seems like a dichotomy. Um, I'm going to go with she's learning to play a guitar. Okay. Kelly, what do you think might be the untrue statement? Okay. You know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to go the same one as, as uh, Kathy did. KP. We don't think Nancy's learning play to guitar. play guitar. Well, actually, it's that Nancy writes from eating oh. to me <laughs> to me, no matter what. You know, I was so in awe of you. I thought that was true. That's wonderful. You're learning I to play guitar. I wish. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love the tile grouting, too. Um, that seems like a great... Uh, mm makes the greatest mm -hmm. tile tabletops you've ever seen. Oh, wonderful. But it is messy. I, I yeah. bet. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's see. We have one more set of statements to look at. So for Kelly, it takes Kelly four years to write each book. Kelly came up with the last paragraph of book two before even starting the story. And each time a new character pops up in her writing, she pulls a slip of paper out of a jar of names to name them. So, Nancy, which one do you think might be the untrue statement there? I don't think it takes her four years to write each book. Okay. Um, KP, what do you think might be the untrue statement? That she pulls a slip of paper out of the jar of names. Okay. And you are right, KP. Each time a new oh. character pops up, there is not a jar of names. Although that seems like it might be helpful. <laughs> well, so it is a sad fact that it's taken me four years. I published the first one in 2012, second one in 2016, and now I'm hoping to get this one out at the end of this year. So I need to write from eight until noon every day, no matter what. Or <laughs> yeah. I'll be up in the middle of the night from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. or something. Well, you're working all day, though, right? Yeah. That's yes, I am. I work so almost a full-time job. Um, but and then the other one is true that I actually came up with the paragraph, the last paragraph, of the second book before I even, and that and that didn't have anything to do about the crime. It was about the relationship with her and the two men. <laughs> uh, no, that's a great place to start. Well, that is wonderful. Thank you guys so much for being um, willing to play along with me for that. I, I saw it at another panel and I just thought it was a cool way to get to know our authors a little bit. And um, so while we, before we close out, um, let's have you guys each plug uh, what your next project is, where we can look for your work coming up. And I'm going to go ahead and start with Nancy this time. Well, um, I'm in the process of writing it, so I don't know when you're going to see it. But Aggie has moved to Seguin, and she is activities director at Pecan Paradise Retirement Center. And uh, there's all sorts of shenanigans that go on there. So I don't know, I have a lot of new characters and of course um, there's a really red hot game warden who helped save them out of the, out of the river. And so he will be there and Sam's still in San Antonio. And so that's kind of a off and on deal. So I think it'll be fun. Don't have a title, don't have a pub date, just, slogging along well we will definitely look forward to that kp what have you got coming up for us um the next in the mad hayden series four reasons to die um i am going gangbusters thanks to the pandemic there's nothing else to do <laughs> um the um premise on this one is have you heard of the cabot cope syndrome when it comes to mysteries mm -hmm. okay it's um Jessica Fletcher, Murder, She Wrote. Um, it took place in a small little town of Cabot Cove, and it's amazing that there was anyone left to live there after, you know, because she was just so popular uh, as far as the series goes. And I realized that Pastor Hayden was going to be in the same situation in Wilkes. So uh, now I, that was like, I'm going to call that a trilogy. So this trilogy is now going to take place in Austin, uh, where a whole lot more people can die more believably. So, um, <laughs> so that's, it's moving on. It's moving on. 
Oh, great. And Kelly, what if, what if you were mentioned the one, what's that title going to be? Yeah. Oh, that's the, the third one I'm working on. So I think mm-hmm. it's called closing time. Okay. And, uh, and I am really going to work really hard to get it out by December because otherwise I'm going to mess up my every four years because I'm going to go over. So I'm thinking, I know nano Rymo oh, usually is for starting new projects, but I may just slip in there and use that time to try to get this one complete. And this one, it was, took a little bit, longer because the first two are set in St. Louis and this time for some reason I decided to take her and and put her on uh, in New York to pick up a uh, a vintage trailer and so she is driving back with one of her friends Peter Mm -hmm. and um, they are driving back to St. Louis and I figured you know if they can make a whole movie about a guy talking to a volleyball I can make a book out of her driving back in an RV. So, but it's become complicated because, you know, the murder didn't happen until like chapter nine, which is usually really way too late. So I'm doing some reconstruction on it. Okay. So, but hopefully I'll get it out by, by December. Wonderful. And another reason that Kelly is so busy is she does our publicity for Sisters in Crime. She does our newsletters and all that kind of stuff. And she's wonderful. Oh. So we're a reason that she's not getting it out there like she wants. <laughs> well, we will all look out for it, I'm sure. And thank you so much for plugging Sisters in Crime and to Sisters in Crime for um, having all of you wonderful authors um, visit with us here at the Pflugerville Library for these panels. Mm-hmm.